grateful to God to be back tonight. And we're just excited always whenever God gives us the privilege to worship. Uh, there will come a day when you can't worship. And you want to appreciate every moment you have uh, to worship God in spirit and truth. Uh, it is a privilege to worship God. Uh, he does not need your worship, but he gives you the privilege to worship. And we just know that God is worthy to be praised and he's worthy to be honored. I'm getting to a point in my life where, uh, that, you know, you can, you can praise him for what he does. You can praise him for what he has done. You can praise him for what he will do. But I'm at a point now where I just praise him just because of who he is. <laughs> I, just, I just praise him because he's God. Uh, when you just praise him because of his character and his attributes and, and all that God is, he just provokes us uh, to give him praise. And we just thank God for each of you that are here. And again, I've had a great time. I always have a wonderful time when I come home to this family and uh, to be with Pop has just been an absolute privilege. He, he always wakes up my apologetic bones. He's just sitting in the office talking to him. I'm ready to, ready to fight, ready to debate somebody. It just wakes me up and uh, I just appreciate his encouragement throughout the years and uh, I, I just, uh, I always, even when I'm doing meetings somewhere else, I take the time to let people know how grateful I am to him. Because, you know, with young preachers uh, have a lot of difficulty with accepting that someone helped them get where they are. And I think it's the highest form of disrespect not to acknowledge that somebody deposited in your ministry and made you who you are. So I, I personally thank God for Pop and for what he's done for me and what he's done uh, for the entire brotherhood. Now, uh, I would be lying to you if I told you I wasn't tired. Mm, we had some good food. Lord have mercy. Man, it was it was sinful. It was it was it was just it was it was wrong on all levels. It was my God. I mean, it's it was man. They had oxtails, man. Like who does that? What what church makes oxtails for a luncheon? I mean, usually it's y'all know it, it, it's fried chicken, some mashed potatoes, you know. But when I do meetings, that's the middle day luncheon. I, I can almost time it. This was, this was ridiculous. It was, it was chocolate cake and, and it was, it was, it was collard greens. It was oxtails and rice. And, I mean, it, it just got ridiculous up there. And I, I just, man, I, I had to wow. I, and when they, when they told me what was on the menu, I said, man, stop playing. This is just. And uh, we got out about three o'clock. Had to come back for five. But I'm tired. Y'all understand, don't you? All right. But turn to Romans chapter eight. <laughs> we almost finished. <laughs> I'm tired, man. But it was just, it, it was great. But I, I just, I'm gonna tell you though. I, I really thank God. It, it does my heart great joy to see. Uh, a church appreciate him like this. Uh, it really does my heart great joy because he deserves every bit of it. And I just thank God for what he's doing. This is a familiar verse. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 26 of Romans chapter 8. I'm going to read into verse number 30 and then uh, explain this for a few minutes and, and just remind you of what you already know. Verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. All right, sir. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, yeah, yeah, yeah. because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Right, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, yeah. to them who are the called according to his purpose, yeah. for whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate yeah. to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. 
I'm going to lift for a subject very quickly. Trusting in the purpose of God. Yes. Trusting in the purpose of God. I don't have to tell you that uh, the book of Romans is Paul's great didactic epistle. If some would call it his magnum carta, it would, they would call it the constitution of Christianity because the apostle Paul in this letter unfolds the very dynamics and core of what Christianity is all about. Paul in Romans chapter 1 gives his thematic thrust when he says, I am not ashamed yeah. of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, for as it is written, the just yeah. shall live by faith. It is the essence of this letter. The Apostle Paul, having never been to the church at Rome, had made promise that he would come by to see them. But in his efforts to help them understand his gospel, he begins to unfold what Paul calls the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. In other words, man is not made righteous on his own merit but he is made righteous based on the work, the finished work of Jesus Christ in which God puts righteousness on my account. I would want to announce to all of you that on your best day, you cannot earn God's salvation. Uh, on your best day, you are never good enough to earn the salvation of God. But I want you to know that righteousness was placed on my account by the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now what Paul does is Paul wants us to appreciate this imputed righteousness by making an argument that all are under sin. So in chapter 1, he makes very clear that the Gentile world was in sin. And then in chapter 2, he makes clear that the Jewish world was in sin. And in case you missed chapter 1 and chapter 2, he says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. By the time we get to chapter 4, he brings Abraham into the picture to show that Abraham was made righteous by faith prior to him being circumcised. It was not by him meriting this righteousness, but it was by faith in God, trusting in the promises of God that he was uh, that righteousness was placed on his account. So based on that argument in chapter 5, verse number 1, he says, therefore, we are justified by faith and and we have peace with God. Now let me also be clear that justification by faith is not to the absence of obedience, yeah. but that it's a faithful obedience to God. We are justified by an obedient faith in which that faith is obedient not to earn salvation, but to receive salvation. Let me be clear about that. When we obey God in the gospel of Jesus Christ, where our obedience is not earning salvation, it's it's receiving salvation. You don't want to misinterpret your obedience. A lot of people think that because I obey, God owes me salvation. God don't owe you nothing. You obey God, meet the conditions stated by God, and by that faithful obedience to God, by doing what God said, we receive salvation because we have met God's conditions. Now some was interpreting the Apostle Paul to teach this gospel of grace, and they said he is teaching a grace that endorses sin. Paul anticipates his opponent in chapter 6, and he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may about God forbid how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein in other words the apostle Paul says while I teach grace grace does not endorse sin grace teaches us to deny sin and he says that when we were baptized we died to sin therefore we no longer practice sin I think we need to stop by chapter 6 for a minute because what Paul does with baptism in chapter 6 is the Apostle Paul wants to be clear, the reason we do not have loyalty to sin as our master is because we destroyed that allegiance when we died to sin. And we died to sin when we were baptized into Christ. He is actually showing that when we were baptized, there should have been a lifestyle change. Y'all yeah, yeah, yeah. not saying nothing. Y'all not... 
That's what he's arguing in chapter 6. It's not only about baptism being essential. It, baptism is essential, but that's not what he's arguing in Romans 6. What he's arguing in Romans 6 is on the basis of being baptized, you should now have a changed lifestyle because you went from one slavery into another slavery. But God be thanked that you were the slaves of sin, but you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin, you became a slave of righteousness. So God frees you from one slavery and puts you in another slavery. God frees you from slavery to sin but then makes you a slave of righteousness. And my lifestyle should reveal that when I got baptized, I changed my course of action. Now that ain't my sermon, but there's some good stuff on that. In Romans chapter 6, uh, to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, uh, his servants you are. And then it goes on to show that we move from one slavery to another slavery. Paul begins to announce the depth of that slavery in chapter 7. In chapter 7 he said, I am carnal, sold unto sin. And then he begins to describe his struggle with trying to meet the Mosaic law. He said, when I would do good... The evil was present with me. Uh, when I try to do right, I, I end up doing wrong. And while I was trying to meet the law of Moses, while I was trying to reach God's standard, I saw another law warring in my members against the law of my mind. And then he came to the conclusion, oh wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? Y'all remember this in the Bible? Who shall deliver me? Some folk need to be able to empathize with that because all of us have tried do right when we end up doing wrong. We don't meet God's standard perfectly and we needed somebody to come to deliver us from this body of sin. Then Paul said, I thank Christ Jesus. I thank Christ Jesus, my Lord, who has delivered me. And then chapter 8, he says, therefore, there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who live not after the flesh, but according to the law of the Spirit. Now in chapter 8, he begins to show that we're no longer under the law, uh, or rather we have been freed from the law of sin. Now the law of sin is not the law of Moses. The law of sin was the indwelling of sin that was warring against the law of his mind, which the law of Moses couldn't fix. So the law of Moses couldn't fix the law of sin, so we needed Jesus to come to deliver us from this sin that the law of Moses couldn't fix. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Law of Moses can fix this bad boy. The law of Moses was a mirror that when you looked at it, all that thing did was show you your flaws. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Law of Moses picked up the mirror and said, this is how ugly you look. Are y'all following what I'm saying? All right, now the law of sin I've now been made free by Jesus Christ and God has placed me under the law of the Spirit, the rule of the Spirit in my life. So now he goes on to show that now that we're under the law of Spirit, we have received the Spirit of adoption and the Spirit bears witness with my Spirit that we are the children of God. And then he goes on to show not only do we, uh, do we acknowledge that the Holy Spirit acknowledges me as a child of God because the Spirit bears witness or testifies that I am a child of God because I've obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now he says, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our infirmities. When I don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit makes intercession. And after the Holy Spirit makes intercession, you should be able to get up off your knees and say, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Listen, when you finish praying, when you finish talking to God, even when you don't know what to pray, and the Spirit makes intercession, the confidence we have is that when we get up off our knees, we trust that God can make all things work together for his ultimate purpose. Are y'all following what I'm saying? So in your life, you've got to trust in the purpose of God that everything happening in this world God knows how to take this and make it work with that and take that and make it work with this so it will ultimately work out his purpose yeah. then he tells you what the purpose is yeah, yeah, yeah. and now then he tells you what the purpose is because a lot of Christians let me tell you 
uh, the more I preach, the more I want to preach on this purpose. Now, there's a lot of folk don't like to preach on the purpose of God. They call it milk preaching, and they, they call it too basic, and they, they call it too fundamental. And they say, and, but, but God doesn't call it basic, fundamental, or milk. God calls it eternal purpose. God calls it unsearchable riches. God calls it the manifold wisdom of God. It's amazing that what God calls his wisdom and what God calls his purpose, we call milk preaching. We call it too basic, and the church needs some kind of other message I've come to tell you I'd rather call it what God calls it when God talks about the plan of salvation he doesn't call it milk he calls it purpose manifold wisdom unsearchable riches eternal purpose and I've come today to tell you there will never be a reason why we should stop preaching the purpose of God and I'll tell you right now when you pray and you finish praying you should get up and say, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Well, what's the purpose, Brother Hayward, for whom he did foreknow? Oh, God. For whom he did foreordain. He did predestine to be conformed to the image of his dead son. Listen, let me just be a few minutes. You know this stuff already. I don't preach nothing that pop don't preach. In fact, I preach half his sermons uh, all my life. Yes, sir. Listen, predestination is not the idea of God sending some folk to heaven and some to hell. Right. That, that's not predestination. I actually take the position that when you talk about predestination, predestination, and whenever it's brought up, tells you what was predestined. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you just keep reading, predestination will define itself. Now, some people say, well, pray, well, 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 wait, you know, predestination means some going to heaven, some going to hell. That's not what that means. Look at the text and let the text tell you what's predestined. Now, whom he did foreknow or foreordained, same word used to describe Jesus in 1 Peter 1 9, when it says Jesus was foreordained yeah, yeah, yeah. before the foundation of the world. It's speaking of not just foreknowing something, but pre planning something. Yeah. Jesus, or God rather, in his mind, pre Destined, he foreknew in that he pre-planned, foreordained, he foreordained, the text says, uh, for whom he did foreordain, he did predestine. Now the question is, look at the text. What did he predestine? He predestined us to be conformed. Yeah. See the text? To the image of his dear son is speaking about what God planned for his people. God not only planned the people, he planned their destiny. I want to have a people that's conformed to the image of my dear son. Watch the reason. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. This is the church in the mind of God. This is Paul saying, let me take you past Genesis 1 verse 1. Let me take you past when the Bible says in the beginning God created. I want to take you beyond that sentence into God's mind so you can see God predestined a people to be conformed to the image of his dear son. That he might be the firstborn. Now firstborn means yeah. preeminent. Yeah. Jesus is my big brother and the church is Jesus little brothers y'all got look how good look, look at the text oh y'all something else look at the text that he Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers the church in God's mind is Jesus as the preeminent son with a bunch of little brothers. Hebrews 2.12 in the midst of the church. But rather before I get to that, he says, I'm not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus is our brother. And that's how God preplanted. God said, I want my son to be the preeminent one among many brothers in which he holds the first rank. Yeah. Now, in Colossians 1, you see it in live, in living color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Colossians 1, 18. For he is the head of the church, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, 
he might have the preeminence. That's the church. And that's how God planned it in his mind before the foundation of the world. Go back to Romans 8, almost done. All right? Now, when you go back to Romans, whom he did, no, whom he did for no, he did predestinate for no pogi no skull, which means foreordain. He did predestinate pro horizo to draw a horizon, draw a boundary line. He did predestine them for what? To be conformed to the image of their son. If you wanted another verse where you can see predestination explain itself, it's in Ephesians 1, yeah. verse 3. Yeah. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that he should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us yeah. unto the adoption. See, every time you see predestination, the text tells you what he predestined. Are y'all following that? Do you see that he's not sending nobody to heaven or hell? Now you might go. But, but that's not what God predetermined for you. Are y'all following that? All right. Now, uh, he is the head of the church. When you come back to Romans 8, he's dealing with what's, what's in the mind of God. Then he tells you how he brings the plan into execution. Whom he did foreknow, he did predestine to be conformed to the image of his dear son, that he might be the first born among many brethren. Then he says, for whom he did predestine, then he also called. God, bringing y'all know this already, God brings the plan into execution through a calling. Interestingly enough, that's what ecclesia is all about. Ecclesia means an assembly that has come together by a summons. God sends out the summons of the gospel and it brings together his assembly. So God calls us and then God justifies us. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 11. It says such were some of you, but you were washed. And then it says, and you were justified. Yeah. Justification, church, is such a beautiful term yes, because it means to declare me righteous Amen. when I know full well I'm guilty. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, Y'all take them halos off for two seconds and you can put it right back on after church is over. <laughs> we are called righteous, justified, when we know full well we're guilty. Because Jesus takes the wrath on my behalf so that in as much as he represented me as a sinner, Jesus imputes righteousness on my account in which God allows me to leave with the status righteous although I'm not. I, I said although I'm, although I'm not. So let, let's not lie to each other for a quick minute. Every now and then, y'all mess up. Is that right? Yeah. Every now and then, you do the wrong. You are never perfectly righteous. And when you stand before God, you still wouldn't be perfectly righteous on your own merit. When I stand before God, I've got to be clothed with His righteousness. Yeah. Who me did? No, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his dead son. And then it says that whom he called, he justified. And then last but not least, whom he justified, he will glorify. Yes, glorify. Talking about ultimately our resurrection and our journey to heaven, our glorification. What Paul just did was give you a view from eternity to eternity. Yes, Paul starts in eternity and said, here's how it was planned. Yes, Paul shows it's going to be executed. And then Paul says, this bad boy is going to end in eternity. So God, or rather Paul, just shows you the purpose of God from eternity to eternity. Yeah. It started in his mind and it will end up in glory. And what you have to do is in this day and time, no matter what happens or who becomes president, we trust in the purpose of God that no matter who's in office, all things are working together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Doesn't matter who's running things or who think they're running things, God is still sovereign and is still working out his plan. So when I pray, when I pray, when I get up off my knees, I come up with an in we know attitude that everything 
is going to work out exactly as God determines it to work out. And that simply means his purpose will be fulfilled. And you got to know that, church. Even when you don't know it, God is trying to work with you and through you. Often to bring about his... You all remember Joseph? And you remember how Joseph was betrayed by his brothers? And Joseph saw a vision? And then Joseph got sent to Potiphar's house? And how Joseph goes to prison? And then Joseph ends up on the right hand of God, on the right hand of Pharaoh? He goes through all of that, not fully always understanding it, but when he got to the end of the story, he said, we're too meant for evil. God meant for good. And not Joseph's personal good, but for God's redemptive good. Because had Joseph not done what he was supposed to do, the seed promise would have died with Judah. Because the famine was coming to kill Judah. The famine was threatening the seed promise. God had to raise up Joseph, not for Joseph, but to save the Hebrew family, which were the very ones that betrayed him. But you are working in the purpose of God. It ain't about always what God's trying to do for you. It's what he's trying to do through you. Because God is trying to work out his purpose. And that purpose is in Romans 8. And I pray to God that more gospel preachers will continue to make known this purpose. We got a lot of gospel preachers preaching everything except this purpose. So you can have a congregation full of folk that don't know what their purpose is. And then ask why we ain't growing. Praise God. Do you know what you're here for? Do you understand what was on the mind of God? And when we preach the purpose of God, we become a purposeful church. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. You can be an act. Watch this now. I'm, I'm done. You can be an active church that's not purposefully active. You're just active. That means you're doing everything except what God really desires so we can't it's not just about being a busy church it's about being a purposefully busy church and doing that which is in line with God's eternal purpose and I promise God will bless us so I hope you trust in the purpose of God that no matter what I go through in this life God is working out his purpose he's working it out and it's going to end in glory. My resurrected body is going, it, I'm going to change in the twinkling. Man, y'all act like y'all see that stuff every day. My body is going to change in the twinkling. The, 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 the Jesus is going to come back, never put his feet on the ground. He's just going to be in the air. And then, praise the mighty name of Jesus, the dead in Christ will rise first before those that are alive go up. So we'll see the dead in Christ going up. They will have a resurrected body. And then those who remain, if we remain, as we watch them go up before long, we start. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ain't that going to be crazy? I mean, can you imagine like, the dead in Christ rise? Jesus is waiting in the air. And wow, they have risen. We are watching and gazing. And all of a sudden, and as we go up, our body changes. And we don't know what we'll look like, but we know that we'll be like him. That'll be forevermore. That's why I got to preach this purpose, man. Ain't nothing better than this. All right, I'm done. Um, God bless you tonight. If you're here and you want to become part of that purpose, I would love for you to answer the call of God so that you can become a part of his summoned assembly. Yeah. Upon this rock, I'll build my ecclesia. Yeah. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Yeah. And then, of course, you get into that by hearing the gospel, believing it to be true, repent of your sins, confess Jesus to be the Son of God, and then be immersed in water for the remission of your sins and do what they did according to the historian Luke who recorded in his historical documents in Acts 2 how man was first converted. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to guess about this conversion. History recorded it for us. Yes, and history says they repented and was baptized. Every one of them in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Luke, how do you know? I did an interview with the eyewitnesses. I did the research. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you'll be added to the church right now tonight. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. 
and somebody may be here that wants to become part of the purpose, why don't you do it now as we sing the song of invitation.